Eric Long here with Quest Trust Company. Uh, today, we're going to be going over a lot of really unique topics, but one of them that I think is one of the most important aspects that a lot of people miss, and that's really a Roth conversion. More importantly, depending on when your investment is, what the investment is, is there a certain time you should do a Roth conversion? So what we did is we actually, uh, we do a lot of work with a couple of individuals, and we brought in a very specific speaker to talk about this topic exactly. Now, before we dive into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about Quest, right? And I always love to say is we love tax-free wealth, right? We love to see it when people, and Quincy used to call it sticking it to the IRS, right? When someone is using their retirement account to make money, avoid taxes, that is the key. That's where real wealth building tactics come into play. So a little bit about Quest real fast, right? Or right before we start to dive in, we're going to quick disclaimer, Everything you guys hear today is only for educational purposes, right? We're not here to give you investment advice. We're not here to give you legal advice or tax advice. We're all here to try to give you the best education possible. So if uh, you have any questions, monitor and utilize that chat box down below. We have several moderators on here. Also, if you want to pitch your own investments, please feel free. You guys can network with one another down below. Obviously, we're still not quite back to doing these things live. Now, as we dive into this, I always like to say, what is a self-directed IRA? Obviously, Quest, we consider ourselves a self-directed custodian. However, this is really a made-up term. It's a marketing term, right? Your retirement account that we hold here at Quest is the same retirement account that you have sitting at any type of public custodian, whether it's Fidelity, Charles Schwab, Merrill Lynch, it doesn't matter. The difference comes down to what you're allowed to invest in. When I have a retirement account sitting at one of those public companies, I can only invest in public assets, stocks, bonds, annuities, mutual funds, CDs, whatever. But if I take that same IRA and I move it over to Quest, we can now invest in private assets. So what's a private asset? For most people on this, it's going to be something real estate related, single family homes, notes, multifamily, right? It could be condominiums or tax deeds and liens, options, you know, something along these lines. Notice there's not one that's better than the other. They're just different. If I want to buy a public asset, I got to go to the public side. And if I want to buy a private asset, I got to go to the private side. So I always like to bring up a bunch of diversification aspects about the self-directed IRAs from true diversification. Remember, if I have an account sitting at Fidelity and it's all in Fortune 500 stocks, you might feel that it's diversified, but it's really not because if the stock market crashes, we see that portfolio come down. So take a portion of it and let's move it to the private sector. The biggest reason most people like to do this is the tax savings though. Obviously, when you do an investment, personally, all your earnings are taxable today. However, if we do the same deal inside a retirement account, we can avoid taxes and many times, not just defer them, but truly, truly avoid them. Lastly, I like to label this as something investing in what you know best. When you're using a self-directed IRA at Quest, you're usually investing in something tangible. You can touch it, feel it, see it. You can go look at your asset. That's something you don't get in the private or in the public sector, right? When I buy stocks, I don't really own anything. When I have a mutual fund, I don't really own anything. So a lot of times I like to say investing in what you know best comes down is the key to wealth building. Now, if you would like to get more information in something like that, Quest host so many different events, all right? More importantly, check out our YouTube channel. If you guys have never seen our YouTube channel, everything we do right now is broadcasted on YouTube and stays up for a long period of time to make sure we can get you the best education possible, all right? In addition, we have really cool events coming up like our QuestCon Live that's gonna be starting on April 16th. We're bringing in speakers from across the US. Now, if you want one of these tickets, all right, you let me know. Set up an IRA today it does cost you 100 bucks, but I will not only give you a discount on a QuestCon Live ticket, once you go to do your first deal, Quest will cover your first transaction. So literally, it's $100 to set up an account, but we'll give you $125 as a credit and hook you up with a discounted QuestCon ticket so you can still attend the event that's right around the corner. So that's pretty much what I am going over. Uh, just Kind of honestly killing time as we get a couple more people that's kind of jumping on and attending. Now, as uh, before I bring in our next speaker, I wanted to talk a little bit about him because he's definitely the biggest guy in real estate. 
He really is. He actually, he's inherited the name Big Mike, right? Now, one of the unique things he does is he's raised capital from across the U.S. for different platforms in real estate. Not only is he an expert in raising capital, he's also, also an expert in trying to figure out when is a good time to do a Roth conversion. A lot of our clients have done multifamily deals, have invested in some sort of uh, you know thing where they invest into an operating rating agreement and they raised a bunch of money, but at first they see kind of this dip down. This is okay. And Mike's going to be talking about that today. So Mike, are you with me? Hi, Derek. Big Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Great to see you. And as always, uh, I wanted to give the credit to Quest team and all the awesome educational events you do. Thank you. So you guys are the best in the industry. Yeah. From the bottom of the heart of my heart, you 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 just educate to the nth degree. So thank you for the service. I always like to say you're one of the biggest guys in real estate because Mike, you're like seven feet tall, aren't you? Not quite. I'm I'm six four and a little bit on a heavy side. And, ah, and, six uh, four. Wow, well, I'm way over exactly. <laughs> but I'm gonna let you kind of take it away and talk about what you can do. I'm here the entire time. All right. Well, the only thing that's happening is my screen is off. If you have any questions, let me know. And guys, remember. This is an open conversation. Ask Mike some questions. We're here to kind of uh, walk you through this. And as things go along, uh, feel free to network with one another. So Mike, take it away. Thank you kindly, Derek. Thank you all very much for your precious time. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through the slides. And um, uh, by, the, by the way, one of the major benefits of investing through self-directed is what Derek mentioned, is you can invest with people who, who you know, like, and trust. When you buy a stock, uh, on publicly traded market, you can't understand, you can't meet the CEO, it's very difficult. The big uh, uh, advantage and, 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 a, and a massive um, competitive strength in, in self-directed investing is you can actually get to know, like, and trust people you invest with. Anyway, so let, let me jump straight to the slides. Hopefully uh, everyone can see this. Yeah, uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and thank you, Quest team. Uh, and thank you all for, for joining. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a tax saving strategy, um, converting traditional IRA to Roth through a, a growth fund. And uh, why are we talking about a growth fund? Why can't you just convert in cash? You absolutely can. We'll cover this. But this strategy, if properly executed, can save you a substantial amount of money on the conversion. So let me kind of run through the slides. Wonderful disclaimer. Our lawyers require us to put it together. This is for informational educational purposes only. We're not giving any kind of advice, nor are we selling anything at all. Um, if you're interested in our family of funds, please request uh, the private place memorandum for each fund. That's the formal offering document. And um, consult with your uh, CPA or uh, tax attorney professional before making any investment decision. Okay, a couple of words about me. So Mike Zlotnik, known as the Big Mike, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm 6'4", a little bit on a heavy side. The name stuck through a number of these uh, uh, masterminds that they go to. One of the masterminds they go to is known as the Collective Genius. It's heavy movers and shakers in real estate all around the country. Somehow they start calling me Big Mike. I don't know why. Maybe because I am that 6'4", and on a heavy side. So the name stuck. Uh, as a result, I started a podcast called Big Mike Fund Podcast. And um, just a couple of words about um, my family. I live in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I've been here for uh, many years. And I'm here because of the family for no other reason. <laughs> I love New York, but at the same time, uh, I'd probably be in Texas, where the quest is if, uh, if I didn't have the family here. So, But that aside, um, uh, four kids and a cat. Lo uh, lovely wife of 21 years, the cat is the fifth child. Those of you who have a pet can appreciate uh, <laughs> how important the pet is. Um, I, um, I've been a passive investor in real estate since 2000, and I've been an active investor, uh, a full-time fund manager since 2009. Uh, it's been a journey, and it's been my passion. So I can't tell you what it is to find something you like to do, you're good at, and can generate you a good living. It's a combination of those three things, and that's uh, that's how I feel about uh, my work in real estate. Uh, we have a family of funds. Currently, um, 
the two flagship funds is Tempo Opportunity Fund. That's uh, our income and growth fund. And we have Tempo Growth Fund. That is our growth fund. And we're launching a new fund called Tempo Income Fund to help folks, specifically IRA, self-directed IRA investors who are looking for income. They are in their retirement part of the, uh, they're in their retirement and they're looking for um, uh, income focused investments. In any case, um, we have a specialty. We do a good amount of bridge lending and fix and flip projects, as well as a number of um, long-term equity investments. Some are focused on predictable cash flow, and some are focused on value-add uh, driven appreciation or growth. Broad range of real estate sectors, from self-storage to multifamily, to the recent trend, the post-pandemic opportunity of conversion of hotels to affordable multifamily housing. We do many, many uh, di different type of deals. It's one of the benefits of working with us is we have a strength that we can pivot and change as market shifts and new opportunities come um, to play. I do have a book out. Uh, if you're bored, you have nothing else to read, um, you could uh, get the book on Amazon. Um, the book is called How to Choose a Smart Real Estate uh, Investment Fund. Um, and then again, if you're bored, and uh, don't have anything to listen to. Big Mike Fund podcast. You could find it at bigmikefund.com. Thank you once again for your time. Now let's jump into the presentation. Oh, just a couple more words about us. So uh, why people invest with us is because uh, past experience, we've been doing this since 2009. Uh, we have a long history of uh, good numbers and uh, we love what we do. We have a great team. So that's one of the key benefits. The other uh, absolutely critical benefit is diversification. I can't understate it. If anything we learn from COVID is that diversified portfolio can do a whole lot better than something very focused. If you were in hotels or hospitality or you were in uh, enclosed mall, malls, you took it on the chin or number of office uh, projects. But if you are well diversified, you could withstand ups and downs, the black swan events, kind of... Um, the roller coaster ride. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, our funds offer a single transparent investment into a well diversified portfolio, depending on the strategy, income strategy or a growth strategy. And we provide best access point. Uh, many of our deals are just not available to public. You can't uh, invest in them directly. By going through us, you're getting access throughout, <coughs> into our network of relationships. And, and that's how we deliver value. We also uh, pride ourselves on. Um, uh, white glove service to our investors. You as an our investor is our most important asset. So we try our hardest to provide uh, white glove service, as I mentioned. We use a uh, third party administrator for full transparency after ba Bernie Madoff fiasco. Using third party administrator, in my opinion, is critical. We don't touch the books. We don't do the books. The third party administrator does the books. We use a fund uh, fund auditor for a Temple Opportunity Fund. Um, it's another third party auditor, a reputable 1,000 CPA firm, as well as a third party SEC counsel. Why all those things are important is to give you uh, investors confidence that uh, the investments are performing the way they need to perform and you have full visibility in, into what's happening. <clears throat> we communicate often. <clears throat> through emails, through online portal, uh, through Zoom calls, annual calls, everything is virtual now. Hopefully one of these days we'll be able to do something live, uh, but for now everything uh, happens to be uh, uh, through Zoom. So thank you, and now let's move forward. Okay, why consider converting from traditional to Roth? Well, real basic concept. <clears throat> uh, do you want to pay taxes today? Or do you want to pay taxes in the future? What's What's happening uh, today? Uh, everybody is expecting the taxes to go up. Why? Well, because the government is spending a lot of money. They're spending well above uh, the tax revenues. It's only inevitable that the tax, uh, taxes are likely going to go up. And one of the ways to mitigate that risk is to uh, convert from traditional to Roth. As part of the conversion, you pay a tax to the government. Typically, that tax is based on the value of the conversion. If you converted $100,000, then you owe IRS taxes based on $100,000 worth of income. And uh, um, the conversion is obviously a unique process that you should con consult with your CPA or your tax uh, attorney. It needs to make sense to you. Uh, it, it could be a great idea for some people or not, great idea for others. So, uh, But many people under most circumstances can benefit from this basic uh, idea. So let's now dive into a couple of options, how you can convert. 
So first of all, thank you to Quest team um, for sharing specific forms that need to be done. So we we working uh, for many years with Quest. Uh, it's in my opinion the best custodian out there. We've had nothing but phenomenal inter interaction, white glove service, love working with Quest. So they make the process fairly, fairly easy. Step number one, you need to do a conversion form. Converting from a traditional to Roth, it's got to get filled out. And literally, we have a link in the presentation, you can't see it, but uh, Derek and the team will, um, will give you access to the forms you need to do to execute the conversion process. Step number two, uh, there is a requirement for a uh, a um, fund manager or a syndication uh, or admin a syndication manager or whatever you invest in uh, that uh, acknowledges the conversion from a traditional to Roth. And uh, the latter needs to be properly filled out. And it also needs to reference the fair market value form. So the fair market value form is a step number three. And that is a form specific to Quest. And obviously other custodians have something very similar um, that basically helps identify the dollar amount, uh, the, the value of the conversion. Now, if you convert in cash, it's easy, that's cash. If you don't convert in cash, you convert to an investment. We get to that in the next slide. It needs a fair market value. So now let's jump into that. There are two primary conversion options. You can convert in cash. So th there are two basic methodologies for conversion in cash. Number one, uh, you can convert early in the year. Number two, you can convert late in the year. It doesn't matter when you can do it, uh, early or late, you will owe taxes based on the cash converted. Whether it happened January 2nd or December 30th, you will pay, the tax liability will be associated with dollars converted from traditional to Roth. Uh, the reason people do it early in the year is they would like to get a free year. Basically, the taxes that you at the end of a year, so if you convert on January 2nd, you don't have to pay the taxes until the end of the year and the next year tax season. So that's a plausible idea. On the other side, you have the conversion at the late point of the year. Why would you do that? You don't get the free time, but what you also get the visibility. How's your business going this year? Are you in a high income this year or low income? Uh, during COVID, people could have lost their um, earnings, their living, and uh, they were in a lower tax bracket as part of the COVID uh, you know, challenges. And they can make the decision to convert because of that uh, lower level of income related to whatever distress that happens in their life. So those are the two options, convert early or convert late to give yourself visibility. How's your year going? The alternative to that is a very simple but very powerful idea. You can convert your investment. Um, uh, when you invest it into a deal, could be a property, could be a partnership, could be a syndication, could be a fund. Uh, and we, when you convert through an asset or uh, an investment, you pay the taxes based on a fair market value of the investment at the time of conversion. That's the basic methodology. You have the control. You decide when to convert. This is extremely powerful because you can pick and choose a better, best time. Some people have talked, what if you have sort of future advanced knowledge of the future. If somehow you have a good visibility of what's going to happen in the future, you could pick a, pick a point when the, the, your investment is at the lowest uh, point uh, of investment. So imagine, well, good luck doing that with the stock market, right? <laughs> when you convert, you don't know whether the stock is going to go up or down. But with real estate, um, you have a little bit of that advanced knowledge. You could also get some visibility into how projects are going. And uh, with that advanced knowledge, uh, you can pick a kind of a lowest value point. And when you do that, you'll pay taxes um, based on that value. So now we'll, we'll go into something really, really interesting. You can invest into growth projects. So growth projects, generally speaking, uh, sort of lose value initially. And then over time, as they execute the growth strategy or the value as strategy, they start making money. And when that happens, there is a bottom of that whole process. And now we'll go look at this, what happens. So uh, most growth projects, growth funds, massive value add syndications have this basic concept. So what is the concept? Well, the concept is that the returns are not linear. You don't get 
10% every year and uh, very steady eddy performance. What you get is you, you, you buy a, a building, you buy um, uh, a bunch of properties, you, you invest into a fund and invest in a bunch of these type of properties. And these properties go through substantial value add phase. So value add could be renovation, value add could be construction, value add could start with demolition first, so the, uh, quite often, if you were to win and assess these projects at a low point of their value as strategy, they're worth less than they originally. Not only that, if they're real estate investments with no uh, producing, with no tenants, no cash flow, and they have to pay taxes, they have to pay insurance, they have to pay upkeep, they're losing money. You can be 100% sure these heavy value at projects just lose good amount of money um, at the beginning. Now they have good prospects when they complete the strategy upon successful execution of the strategy, the value could increase substantially. But if you are picking the point uh, of time when the value of strategy has reduced the value where uh, your investment is now worth less, at that point, if you convert, you may be able to save a whole bunch of money on taxes. So let's look at a very specific example of a growth fund um, and again, this is a hypothetical scenario. Just to be very, very clear, this is not necessarily an example of Tempo Growth Fund or any other fund, although it can look like this. And uh, after thinking about and looking through uh, a bunch of data, this scenario is actually uh, uh, a reasonable possibility. Of course, we don't know the future events, so we can't give you uh, certainty, but there is a good probability that something like this could happen with our fund or, or our family of funds specifically Tempo Growth Fund, or another fund or another syndication that is involved in something very similar. So you can invest $100,000 just for sake of the discussion at, at the beginning of time. And at the end of year one, the investment could be worth 15% less. Why? Well, because a bunch of projects have gone through uh, initial phases of renovation. They've lost a bunch of my money paying mortgage, uh, paying insurance, pay paying other expenses. And some of the uh, construction work is, a, is considered to be a current expense. For example, if a property needs to be um, first demolished, the work that, that is spent is an expense because it, it's not capitalizable event. You didn't put on the new roof yet. You, you went through demolition. So you went through demolition, you spend money demolishing the property. Um, and now, now you have to reconstruct. At that point of time, it's worth a whole lot less than at the beginning of the project. So through statements, and uh, if you use the third-party appraiser, they would come out and say, yeah, it's worth less. So the strategy itself is very sound in its fundamental uh, thinking. So as you go in through these value-add phases, and depending on the type of investment, it could be one or two years, could be longer. It really depends on the value-add. Uh, your uh, value of your investment have come down through the statements that you've received, and in reality, if it went and it got appraised. So here's an example where two years later, a $100,000 investment on a statement would look like $70,000. It's very possible, very uh, plausible. On top of that, this investment is a liquid. If you wanted to convert this to cash, good luck. Go sell this investment right now in the middle of a value-add cycle. You are not going to get $70,000, highly unlikely. So there's a discount for what is known lack of liquidity. Uh, why is it uh, applicable? Well, because uh, illiquid investment, and you can ask a lot of CPAs and a lot of uh, professional appraisals, if it's illiquid and you're trying to liquidate, it's kind of like a fire sale. You've got to convince somebody to give you cash for something that's not easily convertible to cash. So you could get a uh, another 20% discount simply because there's a lack of liquidity. Obviously, subject to the appraiser uh, or CPA, whoever is evaluating it opinion, but it is a very plausible scenario. So look at what could happen at the bottom of the J curve. Again, the J curve is what the returns look like. So two years into the J curve, a hundred thousand dollar investment looks like a seventy thousand in statements, but its fair market value could be worth fifty six thousand dollars. Now, if you can document this and you can have a a uh, uh, an appraiser or a uh, CPA that would write you a letter documenting that. Uh, it's worth now $56,000, you would come to that paperwork to Quest. And as far as I understand, Quest is not a Quest trust company is not in the business of valuing the assets. They are your administrator. 
they need to document this transaction. So if you were to go through the process, provide them with a good documentation and convert at the bottom of the J curve, you could take a $100,000 investment and convert at a valuation of $56,000 as an example. And you would pay taxes on a value that is substantially lower than $100,000. It's the $56,000 because you're paying the taxes on the value of the conversion at the time of conversion. So that strategy could save you a substantial amount of taxes. Now you could just convert it from a traditional to Roth. Just to be very clear, you are still taking a risk. Are you guaranteed that your investment is going to make a lot of money at that point? The truth of it is you're not. Nobody can guarantee this. I would never do that either. You're basically taking a risk. And this has to be very clear. If IRS comes in and says, did you know that the thing is going to go up? Well, you don't know, but you have a foresight. You could talk to the fund manager and get an idea how things are going on these projects. And if you have a decent understanding how things are going, you might feel, hey, this is a good time to convert because on paper, this looks like it's lost a lot of value. But these projects are going per their plan. We believe that over time, they're going to increase in value. There's a risk associated with that. It's, it's, it, <clears throat> but if, you're, if you build substantial confidence in the future that these projects are moving along the right plan at the right speed, you can make the decision. And then you can catch a pretty strong wave of the upside because these projects go through the value yet, they complete, they get their certificate of occupancy or whatever the, the, the process was, they start leasing up, and then they reach full value, full stabilized value, which is substantially higher than at that lowest point at the bottom of the J-curve. So uh, if you follow this type of a concept, and it, for, for example, your investment in five years could be worth $175,000. So year two, it's worth a whole lot less. Year five, it's back to its full potential. And when that happens, you could exit the investment and uh, realize your great returns. At the same time, you saved a ton of money on this conversion because you converted at a value lower than your cash that you put in. The strategy is very powerful. Obviously, consult with your CPA. Make sure your CPA buys into the idea and they're comfortable with the idea. Uh, but it is a very powerful concept. And if properly executed, it could save you a ton of money. And a growth fund, like Tempo Growth Fund, could be used for the strategy. OK, so uh, what is required uh, documentation? Well, statement. Whatever you invest in, if you invest in a syndication, it's your statement from the um, syndication uh, administrator or manager. If you invest in a fund, it's a statement from a fund manager or administrator. And the CPA letter stating their opinion that the fair market value uh, based on the information they've received. And what information can they receive? It will be a statement from the fund. And then lack of liquidity, typically. So if you find the right uh, appraiser or a CPA that can help you out with that, you can wind up executing the strategy and having Quest documented, report to the IRS the value of the conversion to be at the level where it, it, it got appraised based on that CPA opinion, and you save a ton of money on the whole process. So just a couple of areas of our investing, just, just a few more words what we invest in. And um, uh, we invest in broad range of um, distressed uh, and performing real estate, but Tempo Growth Fund is focused more on value as strategy. So we invest in distressed real estate debt with good downside protection, typically distressed debt. Um, just an example, you could buy a mortgage that's not performing for uh, $7 million while the property is worth $15 million. So you, your, your investment to value ratio is low, your risk level is low, your collateral is strong, and your upside is a default interest that you accrue on an investment. On the other side, we invest a number of value at commercial real estate projects, such as self-storage, number of conversions from old retail to self-storage, or existing uh, facilities that go through an improvement uh, life cycle, um, number of value at multifamily, industrials, and some of the hottest trends that we've seen in the recent um, COVID created environment is hotel and office conversion to multifamily. That trend is fairly um, fairly new. It, it, it was around pre-COVID. And um, what's more really interesting, the picture you see on the top right side is a project we invested in pre-COVID and it exited just recently generating phenomenal returns, home run like returns. So the opportunity existed in the past. 
but the COVID has accelerated the trend for hotels that are struggling and uh, that the highest and best use is no longer hotel, but more of a multifamily, especially affordable multifamily living, this trend is picking up ton of momentum. So uh, hotels like extended stay hotel, residents, inns, number of hotels like Ramada that look like a bunch of uh, studios, they all become very interesting target for a conversion into affordable housing. So we love that sector. We're very dynamic and we are locating a substantial amount of capital into these opportunities. But you can imagine they're perfect example for this strategy because there's a lot of demolition and, and reconstruction that happens initially, reducing the value. And then as they continue to complete the renovation project and start leasing up, the value is created. So th 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 this is what we absolutely love to invest in today. We, in general, when we invest in these type of projects, we're looking for pretty high rate of return. We're taking a lot of risk. These projects are not your super safe projects. Uh, so when we invest in these value add conversions, we need to generate generally at least 20% uh, IRR. IRR stands for internal rate of return. Uh, another way to put it is compounded ROI. So just, just for sake of uh, clarification. It's a very similar concept to our ROI, but it does have compounding built into the math. So when we invest in these projects, we, we have pretty high target. Otherwise, why take the risk? If, you, if, you, if you're not compensated with substantial upside, if these projects go well. Just final words, accountability and transparency. We use Toll Rives as our SEC counsel, and then we use Verivest LLC as our third party administrator. And we're one of the very best verified fund management companies. Um, again, appreciate your time, uh, your, your, your thoughts. Would love to hear from you. I'm at your service. Um, reach out to me again. It gets cheesy with bigmikecall.com. Again, Big Mike couldn't come up with a better name. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm at your service. Happy to chat. Uh, I'm not a CPA. I don't play one on TV. I don't give advice. <laughs> Happy to chat as a fund manager. We're under the First Amendment free speech. Uh, I do I do coaching. So again, it's under the free speech First Amendment rights. So, all right, Mike. So now uh, you purposely have actually kept this down to about thirty minutes or so, strictly so you and I can kind of talk about some of these things, right? And That's the things that we've seen. So, uh, are you ready to dive into some of the questions we got on Facebook and through uh, the Zoom and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, awesome. We, we could talk about uh, this stuff for hours, but the, the concept itself is fairly straightforward. It, it is not uh, sending a shuttle to the, to the moon. Let me put it this way. Now, one of the most common questions that normally when we t when you and I talk about this thing, right, it really comes down to the group you're working with. Okay. So the first question that seemed to pop up on Facebook was, does this, if you choose to do a Roth conversion, the guy, uh, and the way he phrased it was weird, but he seemed to be scared that um, they want to help evaluate the property because like, well, it's a multifamily deal. They're not going to get another appraiser out there in the middle of construction right now. Uh, and would that affect everyone else that has invested into that thing? You know, like how you kind of have to, I think he's thinking that you have to report or something like that to all the investors. Is Do you understand what he's asking? Yeah, I think the question is actually brilliant. So the, the, we have a number of investors that have uh, gone into the fund with, again, as far as I know, they, they plan to do something like that, right? So you absolutely have to communicate with the manager and you can ask the question before you invest, do you have any other investors who are planning to do that? Uh, would you be open to do this uh, appraisal or evaluation or assessment of the value in the middle of the life cycle of that investment, whether it's multifamily or a fund? So. In, in, in our case, this is exactly what we are planning to do. Uh, we can't tell people when to do it, but we have a, uh, some idea when the bottom of the J curve may occur. So if there are enough people with interest, uh, then uh, we would help folks identify a CPA, and then they would have to pay the CPA. We're not doing this for uh, any other reason that uh, if there's enough request, but if it's a competent CPA who's willing to do for one, the exercise to do for all is exactly the same because it's the same asset. So um, you can ask the, the sponsor or the manager the question, do you have other people who are planning to do this? And if they are, uh, would you be open to help uh, with the process? So this kind of leads then to uh, the next thing is when I just asked this question, this was assuming that I'm an individual and I invest into a multifamily group, right? I had my $100,000 
And I put it in with, you know, someone that's raising capital to do this one specific deal. How is it that uh, you're a little different in this area? Like if I have $100,000 and I'm like, you know what, Mike, I, I, I'm I going to reach out to you and I want to put them $100,000 uh, your multifamily group, right? Is it really multifamily or how, do, how does it look for you? Just why is it different? Sure. So your traditional syndication, uh, you could have either performing assets or you could have value add assets, just this high level. There's this stuff in between, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, this concept is generally applicable to heavy value add. You, you need to have whatever the project, you need to have heavy construction, a lot of renovation. They have that, that drop in value related to that bunch of demol demolition and a bunch of projects. Mm -hmm. When you do it with a single uh, investment, you, you have risk concentration. You have one project. If that's sponsored, and I've seen it many times, they buy these heavy value add projects. Let me give you an example. They'll buy a property that has been run down, really badly managed. We have a project we invested in with one of the company sponsors we know in, in Southern Georgia. Not necessarily greatest neighborhoods, but they're specialists. They have the ability to do it. We invested. But if there was an incompetent operator, they can actually lose money. They can go take on a property. I've seen, with I've seen it happen. 40, 50% occupancy, and they start doing the construction and the cost of material is through the roof. They're not able to execute. They can't find the labor. There's risk. So just no rosy you know, picture. There's risk associated with the type of investing. But if you're doing it with very competent operator, the key for value add investments is selection of the people who you're investing with. I can't stress this enough. If it's a very, you got to know, like, and trust them and their ability to execute. Because if you invest with idiots, they're going to destroy your, your investment. It, it has happened many times. It, it has. Close, I have close friends who have invested in this thinking, hey, this is easy. Oh, I'm in California. I'm going to invest in, in, in Georgia. Again, I'm using this as an example. Uh, oh, I can, I can pick up this property. They're cheap. Well, unfortunately, that area is really, really difficult to do any work with. High crime. Nobody wants to work in that area. Construction material, cost overruns you could run things down. But let me compare very quickly to what we do, right? So we invest with a lot of institutional high quality uh, sponsors into these projects with very, very high competent uh, operation, uh, the we call them sponsor or the operator. So as a fund, instead of investing into one project, we diversify across a portfolio of projects. So many deals. So uh, we are at this point, uh, in the Tempo Grow Fund, we have 12 uh, commercial deals. By the time the fund closes, we're planning to be 20 to 30 deals. So when you have risk spread between 20 to 30 deals, even if one goes completely bad, you're still not, lo not losing your money into single you know, deal it's exposure. A little better, it's a little better diversification. Instead of my 100 grand being tied up in one deal, it's kind of tied up in multiple ones, making it, it a little bit more diversified. Correct. It, I would say a lot better the diversification. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> you said a little bit better. Yes, it's still risk, but it's a lot more, you know, 20, 30 is a whole lot better than one. Let me put it this way. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Now, when we talk about Roth conversions, um, one thing that I just like to always bring up is most people are scared to do it. Now, I know the answer to this, right? But can I get your take on why are people scared to do a Roth conversion in one of these deals? Like, what do you think it is? Well, uh, so let, let's talk about the real risk. The real risk is you convert and the damn thing falls in the value further and you actually lose money and you paid the conversion dollars uh, and uh, at a value higher than what it would be at the end of the project, right? That is a risk. That is a real risk. And you absolutely need to have high degree of confidence in the fund manager or sponsor that you're converting at a point where you feel pretty good about the future. That is a real risk. I mean, that's why people are scared. I convert and the damn project fails, right? I just paid a bunch of money in taxes and, and I lost money on my, my investment. That's a real risk. Mm -hmm. And the way to mitigate it, as I said, is to uh, uh, know what's in the project or in the fund, uh, what's in the portfolio, how investments are looking. Are they following the project plans, pro formers, and so on? So, um couple questions, right, is uh, when you guys specifically, when Temple Fund is looking for things, are you guys looking for things in Texas, outside of Texas, all over the board? So it's a great question. We have operated from the beginning of time, uh, not specifically linked to a, any location. We've always done it relationship driven. So the way we invest, we always pick who we invest with. The Warren person, Buffett, three yeah. things, right? He buys companies, 
decides what price to pay people who turn on it. We do it a little reverse. We start with people who we want to invest with. So it always starts with a sponsor, specialist, operator. Two, what projects we invest uh, in. We, we got to know, like, and trust the projects. The projects themselves have to have great economics. And third, how much dollars we want to put in. Uh, and there's two considerations. One is diversification. So we don't want to overload into any project. Number two, can we write a little bit bigger check and get better terms as part of the negotiation? The more money you put into a project, the better negotiation leverage. So the answer to the question is, if somebody's in taxes and we have number of relationships in taxes, then the deal is in taxes. If somebody's in Georgia, the deal is in Georgia. If somebody's in Indianapolis, the deal is in Indianapolis. So we're not uh, specifically focused on the... Um, location. But I do want to say this, that uh, we are mindful of location from the point of view that some cities and states are more difficult to do business in. And a state like Texas is very business friendly. For sure, it presents a generally better opportunity to invest in Texas than here in New York with all disrespect to our lovely, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, governor and, and the mayor here in New York City. Now, uh, someone did ask this, which I think is unique. And I know this is kind of what your presentation was about, but try to sum it up in like a minute, just this specific portion of the question. But can you, instead of converting halfway through the asset, can I convert my traditional IRA to a Roth IRA right in the beginning? Yes, you yeah, absolutely can. But, but you, why you, wouldn't you want to? So you can convert in cash today, right? Think about it. There's a proposal to increase capital gain taxes today as we speak right now. There's a proposal to increase capital gains rate uh, up uh, and that is a, a motivation to convert right now in cash. But absolutely good question. Can you invest through an investment? You can make the investment and then, I don't know, three months later, six months later, say, hey, I can't wait. I want to convert this year. You can do that. Can you uh, get a lower value? Yeah, a little bit lower. You, you haven't had enough time for the investment to, to have a, uh, more of this losses accumulating. So can you do this year? Yes, you can. You just have to be mindful that it takes a little bit of time to reach the bottom of the J curve. Can you go, can you do it on, on, the, on the way down? Absolutely. No, uh, and for those guys who uh, didn't see it in his presentation, right, but the J curve, what he's really mentioning is like most uh, investments where we're dealing, where you're investing into a fund, a multifamily group, uh, anything, anyone that's raising capital, some sort of syndication will last typically, and I mean, it can last less or more, but I'm going to say five years. Is that a safe assumption, Mike? Yeah, this is a J curve again. If you could see yeah. the screen one more time, this is the J curve. Absolutely and, right. So notice, look, the first year you're investing a hundred grand. So if you do a Roth conversion in zero to one, you're converting a hundred thousand dollars. So you owe taxes on a hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah, you, you may be able. So here's an example: Can you uh, convert late this year? Can you invest now and convert late this year? after a couple of negative quarters of statements. Yes, you can do that. So theoretically, you could get a little bit lower valuation. Uh, I don't know how much, but it is a possibility to do it in the same year that you invested. So, but most of these projects do need time to go through the, 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 the J curve to reach the bottom of the J curve. You know, so the decision about, is entirely up to you. Yeah, and it seems to be about year two, year three, right? You're gonna be at that bottom. So if you did a conversion then, Right. That's when instead of you converting a hundred thousand, you're converting and, and, and the example you have on the screen was fifty six thousand. So I'm paying taxes, literally half the amount of taxes almost. That's huge. That's, that's you know? exactly correct. That and and exactly some people correct. they get worried about it, right? Some people, oh, but if we think of what uh if we think about the stock market, if I saw tomorrow that Apple stocks crashed and I owned them, could I do a conversion? Sure. Is Apple stock probably going to go up in the next year again? Sure. Now, could it stay down here? Absolutely, guys. But notice the purpose of what Mike's talking about is this curve. You're hoping to catch that upswing. And that's the real key. That's where you build a lot of wealth, you know? So. Yeah, and and um, Derek, one quick comment, the difference between stock market and um, uh, real estate is with real estate, you have a good amount. A much better predictability. The key word is predictability. It's not guaranteed, but it's predictable. With it's the stock a market, Absolutely. when Apple stock dropped, budget. yeah, you know? when, it, when it dropped, you can drop more. Hey, listen, I don't know, more, more bad news. They got supply chain problems, China, this, that. Like, they, 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 they lose technological edge. Can this, the Apple stock drop further? It can. Uh, but with real estate, again, no guarantees, 
but you have a much better predictability if you have an understanding what's happening with the project or projects if you're in a fund. And if you have good visibility, at that point, you make it a decision with a lot of information and data, not kind of blindly with, with Apple uh, when it just, it just dropped a lot in price. You're sitting and thinking because you don't have advanced knowledge. You don't know what's going to happen. With real estate, again, not guaranteed, but there's enough visibility and predictability that the likelihood of that going up uh, the J curve is, is, you know, is better than I would say than with Apple stock. So unless the hurricane comes in and it takes it, right? Like, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of things you can predict in real estate, you know, just through, especially through experience. Um, I got a good question here from a guy named Brad and it's all about debt leverage. So if I invest into a single syndication, someone's raising $10 million, right? They usually debt leverage it. But if I invest into a fund, is the fund still going to be considered debt leverage? Would it bring on things like UDFI, that type of stuff? So let's start with just the first half of the question. If they invest into a fund instead, is the fund going to be considered debt leverage? So it's a great question. Uh, disclaimer again, consult with your CPA. Now you're going into a gray area, I would say. <laughs> so most of one of syndications, they're leveraged. And you can be pretty clear the amount of leverage that they have. Right. Yeah. That, that's usually, hey, you're putting... 25% down, 75% leverage is pretty obvious. And it's right there in the subscription agreement and stuff. Yep. Yep. With a fund, uh, we have zero leverage on a fund level. So the fund doesn't leverage anything it's, itself, but we do invest the deals with leverage. So that is a valid question. And people have asked me, so how much ever leverage you have on average in all your deals across the entire fund? So we have some deals with zero leverage. Like we invest in distressed commercial debt. Uh, that node itself is not hypothecated, not leveraged. So that's perfect for an IRA. On the other side, if we invest in the hotel conversion to multifamily and they have 70% leverage, there is leverage. So again, this is a massive disclaimer that uh, we have a live fund. In the middle of the fund, things change up and down and the numbers are not exact. We have approximately 60 to 65% leverage within across all investments uh, on average. So there's some leverage in the in investments of the fund, not the fund itself. Fund itself has zero leverage. We have some investments with 75% leverage, some with 70 and some with zero. Somewhere on average is 60 to 65%. This is my best guesstimate today. Perfect. So guys, uh, just to kind of a quick recap, because uh, I'm going to give a slightly different answer, right? And, uh, and uh, Mike gave a perfect thing where it truly does depend. I always joke with the diaper, right? It depends. You know, and so I added a CPA's contact information down right now in the chat box. So if you are going through it and you have questions about reach out to him, he'll let you know. And you can do it via email. Let him know something Quest sent you. But uh, pretty much what I would argue is that your IRA invested into a fund. Okay. Whether the fund does A, B, C, or D typically is, should not affect that it's debt leveraged or not. Okay. Could someone make an argument the other way around? Absolutely, they could. However, I think the best person to answer that would probably be the individual I left right there in the chat box. I think there's a strong argument to be made that it's not considered debt leverage. So, and this is on a recorded thing. Now, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. It's a great idea. The other thing I wanted to tell you, and people have asked, we have massive amount of depreciation passes through, right? If you were <laughs> theoretically, even if there was UDFI, it wouldn't be uh, in the first number of years, if anything. It could only kick in on the back end uh, upon capital gains. But like you said, if there is pretty good opinion that because we are a fund, we have no leverage on a fund level, it's kind of like a blocker uh, in a manner of speaking. Maybe sure. your bit is not something you need to worry about. Again, consult with your CPA. It's a gray area. People have asked. Full transparency here. Not a CPA. They don't play one on TV. <laughs> I love it. Now, uh, I got a great question from another guy named Michael. Okay. Um, how do you ta uh, track the, uh, the TGF, right, to value the IRA? How do you know when it's a good time to convert to the Roth IRA? Right, so if they did $100,000 with you, is there an easier way or are you kind of guessing, like year two, year three? Like, uh, what's a, is there a better way to track that? Sure. So we have generally pretty good view of a life cycle of the fund. So here's a very specific uh, path forward. So the fund will close, the last subscription uh, is January 16, 2022. We can no longer take any more subscription based on our um, private place memorandum. So at that point, uh, we will not take any more money and we're likely going to put most of the money to work 
fairly quickly over the next few months. So the new projects will not be coming on board uh, maybe in early 2022. Technically, we're allowed to continue to investing all the way uh, through January 2023. But we believe most of the money will go to work in 2022. So the J curve on the early investments is already bottoming out. The J curve on some of the new investments is yet has room to go. So somewhere based on life cycle of an average project uh, in 2023, we believe we're going to be at the bottom of the J curve. Whether it's going to be Q1 or Q2, hard to say, but we'll have a reasonably good idea ba based on the statements. You can literally follow the statements and see what's happening. As the statements continue to show losses, at some point, the losses will slow down, and then you'll have a pretty good idea. We are now approaching a bottom of the J curve in a manner of speaking. So, Mike, uh, as we kind of come to an end, right, we're kind of ended up the uh, the presentation right now. Can you give me some good closing statements or better or some other ways to reach out to you? I'm putting your account, calendar link right now in the chat, but um, give, me, give me some good closing stuff. Sure. So, love to chat with people. Again, uh, I'm at your service. You can reach out through bigmikecall.com. Um, and... Um, I mean, I love real estate. Happy to chat with you uh, without giving any advice. So if you're looking to look, a lot of folks can reach out and say, what should I do with my portfolio? Give me some ideas what to invest in. And the answer is, I have no idea. You, you, you have to educate yourself to do it. But I'm a deal guy. Right? If you have something interesting to discuss, uh, happy to chat about. Uh, more than delighted to talk about the deals we have in a fund. We're on the whole thing full transparency, right? So I could literally pull up the whole portfolio uh, right on the screen in front of you and show you what we got in the fund. Now, I'm not here to promote the fund, so I'm not going to do it. But the point is we have full transparency, and um, I would like every investor to feel good about who they're investing with, what is in the portfolio. So they, they have full visibility and then they make a well-educated decision rather than it's a black box fund that does a bunch of things. You have no idea what's in there. One of the things I can say, guys, is uh, if you ever have a chance to meet Mike in person, or big Mike, uh, don't be intimidated. He, he is literally not only the nicest guy, but he's very serious. He's very open about everything. He's very like, yeah, here, let's go look at it. Let's, let's check this out. And that's one of the things that Quest likes to see. We love to see people that are coming very open ended, right? When we can peel back the curtain and there's nothing hidden behind there, that's always something to consider, you know? So, Mike, man, I appreciate you coming on here. I really, really do. I know you and I are getting ready to do another event coming up for uh, uh, Freedom Founders and David Phelps in is it like a week or two. I think it's a week. It's, it's ne next weekend. Yeah, yeah, the other thing I, want, I wanted to, uh, to, to, to do a little bit more transparency about me. So, originally, I'm from the former Soviet Union. I call it from Russia with love, right? Yeah. I'm actually not from Russia. I'm from Moldova. It's a small republic of the former Soviet Union. I immigrated in 1989. Uh, I was a political refugee. So, I'm a U.S. citizen, a U.S. patriot. And being a political refugee from that part of the world, I can tell you, some of the socialistic ideas, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be middle of the road, neutral guy, but I can tell you the socialism doesn't work. It's a dangerous uh, president and I'm not going to get into politics. And, um, but all I'm trying to say, and people have called me big Russian too, even though I'm not, <laughs> I'm not from Russia, I'm from Moldova. <laughs> don't laugh, but it, this, this is the truth. So I'm big Mike, happy to help. Uh, uh, don't get me started with the political environment. I live in New York and, yeah, the current mayor and the current government drives me absolutely insane. And unfortunately, you know, I got to live with the uh, <laughs> with the leadership that that's just not doing a gr uh, great job, to, to say the least. Well, <laughs> you're very welcome. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. So I yeah, but I'm just very clear again. I, I've lived here a lot more than I've lived there, but I still remember that world and um, the final thoughts. We still have to be grateful what America is. It's a whole lot better than what was there and what's a lot of other places in the world. So let's find a way to make uh, United States better again. Hopefully, we will all come back to the common senses to our founding fathers, and we will all work together to make this a better country. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mike. Guys, once again, you can reach out to Mike using his link right below. Okay. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us whether you want to set up an account understand how to use an IRA to invest in, in something like one of these funds, right? Or just in general, if you have questions for myself or Big Mike. Mike, thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.